80 to 85 percent water and free. Bring on another round. I don't know, senor. That is your fifth pitcher of milk tonight. Maybe we make this next one two percent. You never outgrow your need for milk. Something in your eye. There's no excuse for that kind of behavior. Throw the woman out! She's flirting with the men of God! Flirt? We don't need no stinking flirt! Ole, Senor Pedro overcame the temptation and had a glorious tent meeting that night. Jesus! Jesus! <laughs> Jane! Jane! Me find missionary preacher! We get married, not live in sin! Oh, Tarzan! I knew God would make a way! I just hate it when Christian morality influences the media. For almost 6,000 years I've been working on tearing down the world's morality. And now this Christian influence comes along and builds it right back up to the way God intended it. What could be worse? Bartell, and as you can see, our topic this time is sex. What do you pay to play? And we're pleased to have a special guest with us, Mr. Josh McDowell. You say you're talking about sex? That's right. But not the kind of sex you see on MTV or in the latest teenage movies. We're talking about the reality of the truth of sex. And guess what? Sex is not a game. Although like a game, it has winners and losers. And rolling the dice with premarital sex can be devastating. In fact, as you're going to find out in this program, it can even kill. We're going to be discussing what really happens when a boy meets a girl or what happens when boys meet boys or any combination thereof. You know, today's young people are on a dangerous moral cliff and many of them are falling off to their destruction. And the answer is not having an ambulance at the bottom or a fence at the top, but rather to stay off the cliff. God says, don't commit sexual immorality, not because I want to take the fun out of your life, but I want to protect the most powerful sex organ you have. I want to provide for the most delicate sex organ I created you. I want to protect the most sensitive sex organ you have. Your mind fooled you, didn't I? We're pleased to welcome to Fire Night one of America's top lecturers and authors. His name is Josh McDowell. Josh, thank you for being with us. Hey, thanks for letting me be in the clubhouse. You bet. Um, you're traveling right now uh, in, in doing the Why Wait uh, campaign and, and ministry, and I'm sure a lot of people do know about it, but tell us, for those who don't know, a little bit about what Why Wait is all about. Why Wait is about presenting a positive message about uh, God's perspective of sex and sexuality, why he says to wait, and it's using every method of um, live conferences, uh, concerts with the great band Petra, yeah. which I love to be a part of. And then we just finished a film on um, the whole issue of AIDS and the age uh, 
sex in the age of AIDS and who do you listen to yeah. that uh, really addresses the issue of sexuality. And that's what Why Wait is about. Why wait? And then we give the answers. year old girl talking to her high school friends who had been kidding her about her virginity and everything else finally she said I'd had enough and she said look I don't want any more jokes about my virginity I don't want any more pressure to become sexually involved because you need to realize each one of you need to realize whenever I want to any day that I want to I could become like you but you can never again become like me well I'm saying that uh, in first Thessalonians 4 the Apostle Paul uh, talks about living a life pleasing to God and what the will of God is and it answers a question right there when it says if we want to live a life pleasing to God and we want to know the will of God then it says abstain from sexual immorality and immediately you know kids will say and even the parents will say well that's so negative you know Christianity don't do this don't do that well the why wait message is that it's positive and you say well how do you get a positive out of negative do not NLT negative uh, you get it this way inherent or within every negative commandment in the Bible there are two positive principles one to protect the other to provide and when God says in the area of sexuality to wait he doesn't do it because he's a cosmic killjoy he does it because he loves us and he says because I love you I want you to wait because the two positive principles I want to protect you and provide for you so with why wait uh, it's all incorporated around the protecting and the provision that God has when we wait and then the other aspect of why wait is in when we don't wait we blow it and just say well is it too late for God to love and accept me then the second part of why wait is a clean heart for a new start begin anew by the grace of God and his forgiveness
So you don't think it's possible for kids to be in love? Oh, no, I'm not saying that. What happens is kids get confused between the intimacy of love and the intensity of sex. And I was with my boyfriend for six years, and you'd think that was love, but here I am by myself now. Obeying God's principles to wait to have sex until marriage was in my best interest. AIDS will mark the end of the sexual revolution. Hey, you make it sound like we're moments away from some gigantic plague. Personally, I don't know anyone who's got any of these diseases. He was 24. He'd only had two sexual contacts in his life. One was his lucky number. And he's... He was buried last January. church I went to, uh, the youth director decided that he was going to make advances toward me, and so uh, I had sex with my youth director. They weren't going to hire a kid um, that didn't have a high school diploma, that, that dropped out of school, that was 17 years old, and so I had to come up with a way of, of getting money. Yeah, and so how did you do that? Well. I turned to prostitution. Uh, it should be great to see her graduate from high school and see her get married and everything like that, but um, Did you know that by age 20, 86% of unmarried males and 67% of unmarried females will have already had sexual intercourse? The average age for a young person losing their virginity today is 13 years old for boys and 14 years old for girls. 1,100,000 teenage girls will become pregnant in the next year, and 400,000 of those pregnancies will end in abortion. Another 137,000 will end in miscarriage. And even since the push for teenage contraception, we still have had a 400% increase in teenage sexual activity and pregnancies. Now get this, for you that are Christians, a recent survey showed that religious conscious girls were 86% more likely to say that they wanted to be a virgin when they got married. And yet only 14% of these girls uh, will actually be virgins when they get married. In other words, Christian young people are yielding to these pressures too. And I want you to uh, notice what the Bible says. It's very clear. It says in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3 that this is the will of God. In other words, this is what God's plan is for your life. It says that you uh, should abstain from fornication and know how you should possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. God's command has always been to abstain from fornication. That is sex outside of marriage. But apparently this command has fallen on, fallen on on listening ears because 78% of young people in this country believe that there's nothing wrong with premarital sex as long as the two people involved are ready. I don't know, I think it's okay. You know, everyone does it, so why not? It's wrong, period. I think it's okay as long as, you know, the person that you did, you really like them and they're special to you. Wait until you get married. It, it'll be all right if you know the person who you're doing it with. I personally don't think it is uh, for several reasons. One, I think it can run a relationship between two people and, uh, to it just speaks strongly against that in the Bible. You've liked her for days. She acted like she didn't even notice that you existed. You couldn't believe that she said yes when you asked her out. You're a little nervous. You're a lot nervous. But you look good and you know how good she's going to look. You want to make sure the night starts and finishes according to your plan. 
But play it safe. Don't forget your protection, your pocket protection. Thy word have I hid in my heart, O Lord, that I might not sin against you. today. I believe one of the greatest reasons is the lies that the media is telling us. In fact, a junior achievement report recently said that the media, which includes TV, movies, and radio, recently ranked third in influencing the behavior of teenagers, only behind parents and peers. This is a dramatic shift from the 1960s when it ranked eighth behind not only parents and peers, but teachers, relatives, and even religious leaders. I was watching TV recently when my son, a condom commercial came on. This woman dances into a store and she gets two packets. She drops it into her purse, and then the next silhouette shows her having sex, not making love, having sex with her boyfriend. And the next silhouette shows her taking a shower in the morning, putting on a big bathroom. She walks out and has a cup of coffee with her roommate. And then she's like, she says this, last night I became a woman. What were you, an armadillo yesterday? What is the media teaching this generation? The average person views 9,230 sex acts or implied sex acts a year on television. 81% of these sexual encounters are outside of marriage. 94% of the sexual relationships in soap operas are between people who are not married to each other. TV advertising consistently suggests that our sex life will improve if we'll just wear designer jeans, the latest tennis shoes, put on certain colognes, even smoke the right cigarettes. Our movie theaters are full of teen sex flicks that were popularized in recent years by Porky's, Bo Derrick's 10, Kevin Costner's Sizzle Beach, USA, John Ritter's Skin Deep, each plot generally depicting that the cure for everything is to jump in bed. In a four-city study in Michigan, 77% of the girls had seen the six top R-rated films that year. Not one was ever challenged at the box office, although all of them were underage. Each movie contained at least eight instances of sexual intercourse among unmarried people. One had 14. Even MTV has gotten into the action with the likes of the seductive Lita Ford, Gene Simmons of Kiss singing about putting the X back in sex, and of course Madonna and her ever-increasing string of steamy lyrics and music videos. The tragedy is that television does not tell us the truth about irresponsible sex. If you're 16 years old, you've probably already seen over 50,000 scenes of sexual activity on television. And yet, let me ask you this, when was the last time you can remember someone on TV contracting a sexually transmitted disease? It happens 33,000 times a day in real life. When was the last time you saw someone on Love Boat get pregnant from one of their encounters? When was the last time you saw someone say no to premarital sex? It just doesn't happen. The book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse number 7 says, Be not deceived. In other words, don't be lied to. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Stop being lied to, young person. You see, people on television, including JR, never have to pay the price for casual sex. Only you have to do that in real life. Starting to realize that I was never going to have a child come up to me and call me father and put his arms around me and tell me that he loved me. And knowing that when I went to work, if I could ever have a job, normal job, a normal lifestyle, that I would never have a decent woman that loved me or cared about me. And all these things built up to a point of wanting to commit suicide. 
Perhaps the greatest contributor to the teen sex problem in North America is right at home. Inattentive parents and a skyrocketing divorce rate have created a famine of love in many, many families. The average parent today spends 14 minutes a week in communication with their teenager. The divorce rate has skyrocketed from one in every 36 marriages ending in divorce in the 1930s to one in every two in the 80s. I recently spoke with some young girls about their sexual involvement and how they ended in unwanted pregnancies. I asked them what their relationship was like with mom and dad? Um, I was abused by my father, my real father, um, in my home. Um, the, the view that I had of my father was so distorted because I loved him on the one hand, but yet the things that were happening in my life made me want to hate him. My brothers were the ones that, that taught me the facts of life. They taught me this and they taught me that. Um, my dad was, he, he went out and made the money in the family and that's, he and I weren't very close. What kind of relationship did you have with your own father? Uh, I was molested at three. God gave the children to the parents. He didn't give them to the church and he didn't give them to the public. So sex education is the primary function of the family. One of the greatest things I can do for my children is to provide them a model of how a man ought to love a woman. And so whenever we have, and research shows, the number one desire of a lower age teenager, 13, 14, and 15, is a happy home life. The number one fear is a loss of a parent through divorce, all the way down to seven years of age. The number one fear today is a loss of a parent through divorce. You know, family relationships are never easy to work through, but God has answers that are practical for every one of us. It says in the book of Ephesians, chapter six, verse number one, that children or young people should obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. And it goes on to say, you fathers and mothers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. First of all, young person, you may not understand why your mom and dad ask you to do things or not to do things, but understand this. God has given you authorities in your life to protect you, to keep you from harm. And he's promised you that if you'll obey them and honor them, that he'll give you a long life and a good life. And fathers and parents and moms, I want to speak to you just for a moment. Be there for your kids. Your young people need you more than they need anyone else in the world. Give them guidelines and values to live by. Show them affection so that they don't have to go somewhere else to try to find it. Most of all, be an example that they can look to in godly relationships. You know, you can lose a lot of things. You can lose money and you can get money in another place. You can lose your job and, and find another job somewhere. But if you lose your kids, you can never replace them. Call Doug. Okay. I don't even have any change. Do you? Yes. Okay, come on. Well, I better lock this because my purse is in here. We are here this morning to rescue. 
rescue innocent children from being killed at the hands of an abortionist and to save mothers from being exploited and lied to. 25 million innocent children have already been murdered in our country. There are no heroes here today. Excuse me, my life from Channel 5 News. Can I just ask you a few questions? Are you here today to, to take your daughter in to get an abortion? No! I don't believe in killing innocent babies. Well, you should. Well, what I mean is a woman ought to have the choice to choose for her own body. Right. Well, I'm pro-choice. I believe a woman should choose to stay out of bed with a man that she's not married to. And if she does make a mistake and get pregnant, then she needs to choose whether to keep the baby or give it up for adoption. What about cases of life and death? Oh, look, you and I both know that the majority of abortions performed here are not on women in life and death situations. You think it's so easy. Right, wrong, black, white. Well, it's just not that easy. <laughs> you started this. I'm just going to finish it. There is such a thing as truth. You know that? And truth isn't always easy, and it's not always comforting, but it will give you peace. And if the truth were known, your whole pro-abortion stance is based on selfishness and fear. Hi, Connie. Hi, Renee. Oh, uh, hi, Vicki Jo. Oh, can you believe those pro-death, pro-choice people? Are you here with the pro-life rally? Uh, no. Actually, we're just on our way home, just walking by. Honey, you need to go get in the car. Well, listen, we, it's been nice seeing you, but we'll, we'll see you again another time. Well, hey, could we get a ride home with you? Say, Cheryl, come on. Doug doesn't have a clue you're in town. Okay, let's, uh, let's hide you in the kitchen. No, no, he's in the garage. You can't do that. Go up in Doug's bedroom. No, Cheryl, I don't want you in Doug's bedroom. Come over here. Now, Cheryl, just crawl in the fireplace. No, no, you'll get soot on you. Just, just stand by the fireplace, okay? Doug, come on in the living room. Dad, I'm working on the car. I can't wait to see his face. Doug, get in here right now. That's authority. He's really been missing you. Oh, come on, Dad. Just give me 20 minutes, okay? Come on, Doug. Dad, what do you need? Doug, you've got grease all over your cheek. Okay, I'll, I'll clean it up later, all right? I <laughs> and you go, really okay? did it. Doug, uh, how long has it been since you've heard from Cheryl? I don't know, Dad. She never writes anymore. I think things between her and I have kind of fizzled out. But i got to go. Well, wasn't it just the other night that you were telling me uh, how much you'd been missing her? Yeah, but I really don't miss her that much. It's not like I'd go crazy if I saw her again. All right. Hey, I want you to do something for me. What? Go over there and get me the fireplace. Get you the fireplace. No way! Yeah! What are you doing? Oh, goodness. Good to see you, Cheryl. Why didn't you call? What are you doing? I wanted to surprise you. Are you surprised? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of took me a little bit by surprise here. It's not like you went crazy or anything, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you go, sorry, you got some stuff. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, look, I'm going to leave you two greasers alone, okay? See ya. Okay. Well, hey, man, what are you doing? Visiting? Are you here to stay? No, my family went on vacation, and I sure didn't want to go with them. I mean, driving cross-country with my family is like not a vacation at all. It's more like prison, you know what I mean, Doug? Yeah, prison locked in the car, can't get yeah, out. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hey, come on over, man. Oh, that's Susan Foster. She's waiting in the car for me. I'm staying at her apartment. You're at Susan's? Mm -hmm. Well, she's going out with Jonathan, the guy that's on my track team. Good friend of mine. In fact, we're practicing, uh, we're practicing later this afternoon. Maybe you two could come, you know, watch us. <laughs> that's what we were going to do. Oh, great, great. Good idea. Um, maybe afterwards, uh, the four of us could go out on a double date. Oh, that's what we were going to do. Okay. <laughs> great. Uh, well, she's out there. You better hurry. Uh, she's honking her horn. <laughs> Boy, it's great to see you, Cheryl. Well, it's good to see you, Doug. I just can't wait. We've got a lot to catch up on. Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. Bye. Bye. <sighs> your eyelashes to curl like that. <laughs> I'm home. Oh, what a day. I really appreciate your mom taking me all the way back over there to get my car. Oh, uh, yeah. Look at you guys. You put on the new outfits. That's cute. <laughs> well, you can stay for dinner if you like. Oh, thanks. Have fun. All right. Okay.
What do you think of this? Oh, gross, I hate that. <laughs> Makes you look like that one girl, Shelly Smith. Hey, I wonder if her and Scott Kelly have had their baby, little Scotty Jr. I can't even imagine being pregnant at our age. I'm never getting pregnant. Well, at least not until I'm married. Why? Are you on the pill? No, I'm not on the pill. What do you mean by that? Hey, sorry, everybody else is. Well, I don't really have any reason to be on the pill. Do you? No. Well, good, because for a minute there, I thought maybe you weren't, you know, like, pure. You mean a virgin, Connie? Well, do you like this color lipstick? I'm not. What? I'm not a virgin. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Connie? What? If I tell you something, would you promise to keep it a secret? If it's got anything to do with sex, I really don't want to hear about it. I'm pregnant. You are not. No, you're not. What? Are you telling me that right now you've got a baby inside of you? Well, how did it happen? Oh, never mind. Connie, stop it! Can't you see? I'm serious. Do you think I would care about something like this? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're pregnant. You have to have a baby. Yeah, I'm pregnant, all right. Don't you understand? My mom doesn't want me to have the baby. She wants me to have an abortion. That's why we were at the clinic today. I'm just so glad you guys were there. She got real nervous, and that's why we left. Connie, what would you do if you were me? I'd have the baby. Abortion, it's not right, Amy. Oh, Connie, come on. If abortion isn't right, then why is it legal, huh? I mean, it just seems so easy, just a few minutes, and hey, it's all over with. Why does it feel so wrong? I mean, I'm gonna have to go through my whole life wondering what that baby looked like. Do you think I'll ever get over it, Connie? Amy, you do not have to have an abortion. You don't know my mom. Let me show you this. A man gave me this at that demonstration today. It says in the Bible in Isaiah 44, 2, this is what the Lord says, He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Amy, you've got a baby inside of you. It's alive. Now listen, I know you made a mistake, but that baby is innocent. You're the only one who can stand up for its life. There's other things you can do if you don't think you can handle raising a child. There's a lot of people out there that can care for it and love it. I guess I could do that. I mean, hey, I'm only 17. What am I going to do with a baby? Here, take this. Can I pray for you? Please do. Good job, Ty. All right, here we go. On your mark. Get set. Go. Okay, Doug. Get your get your trajectory down just a little bit. Okay, you get your projector down too. <laughs> On your mark. Get set. Go. Jonathan, what's wrong with you, boy? I don't know, Catch. I'm just a little dizzy, all right? Hey, you're not running as fast as you did last year. I'll work on it, Coach. Yeah, you better work on it or you're going to be out of here. You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Clarence, what are you doing? Get out of the sand, Clarence. Now get down there and show me what you can do. On your mark. Get set. Go. How'd I do, coach? I knocked them all down. Did I win? Clarence! 
Fox, if it weren't for your dad making a sizable donation for this track, you'd be off the team! Hey, girls. <laughs> Get over there! Now look over here, you bunch of candy stripers. It looks to me like the only running you've done all summer long is down to shopping bop to eat more Twinkies, especially you, Jonathan. Now this team needs character. And that's why I'm here, to teach you girls to be like champions. Now I think you guys got potential, but I want to hear you bark. Yes, sir. sir. I said bark. Sir. Ah! All right, that's enough. Now listen up. Ty here is the only one that's turning his physical. Now if the rest of you guys don't have it turned in by Wednesday, you're not going to compete this weekend. You hear me? All right, hit the showers! Move it! It's about time you girls got here. I'm tired of looking at all these guys' legs all day. Aw, oh, come on, Jonathan. My legs are in better shape than Susan's. Shut your stupid face, Ty. Well, I can see uh, we don't need any introductions here. Everyone knows each other. You guys uh, looking forward to tonight? Yeah, where are we going? Clarence, uh, Jonathan and Susan and Cheryl and I are going on a double date. Well, hey, Ty and I could go. We could make it a triple date. Oh, I guess that'd look pretty stupid, wouldn't it? <laughs> Come on, Clarence, let's go over to your house and go swimming or something. Huh? Hey, Susan, why don't you give me a call sometime? I've got something you might be interested in knowing. I bet you do. Hey. What's all that about? Don't pay any attention to him. He's a jerk. Yeah. Hey, we're going to hit the showers. See you guys tonight at 7. Yo! Thanks for the swim, Clarence. <laughs> Even though it was a little bit chilly. <laughs> well, hey, any time, Ty, but uh, it's getting kind of late, and i got to read with Emily Johnson uh, tomorrow in Ooh. drama class, <laughs> and uh, I don't know any of my lines. Oh. Well, well, hey, I'll read through them with you. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that. Why? It's a girl's part. <laughs> oh, come on. I love drama. I'll play any part. Well, well great. Let me get the script. Have you seen my watch, Clarence? Oh, wow. That's really cool. It's got Donald Duck on it. I bet it really even tells time. You like it? I, I love it. It's yours. No, I couldn't take it. No, seriously. Seriously. I have another one just like it at home. Really? Yeah. Well, gee, thanks. Hey, I'll never forget it. I owe you one. All right. I'll remember that. Okay, I'm going to be Bernard, and you be Juliet. Okay. Oh, Bernard and Juliet, huh? I remember this one. This is a kind of a romantic comedy, uh, but a little too romantic for you, huh, Clarence? <laughs> Why you say that? Well, I mean, I, I just never see you with any girls. Oh, I'm with girls every day at school. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, you know, like on a date. Well, hey, it's not due to any lack of interest on my part, I assure you. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Okay. Juliet, Juliet, your eyes are like pools from the Alaskan oil spill, and your nose is simply a reflection of the 70-meter ski jump at Winter Park, Colorado. Oh, Bernard, your words have pierced my heart like arrows poisoned with a love that cannot be quenched. Golly gee, you're good! <laughs> <laughs> your hair, it's like... Golden grams in the morning. And your nose, it's like a leaky faucet. <laughs> that is great. I hope Emily reads half as good as you. <laughs> One thing I really like are your lips and your earlobes. Lips and earlobes, lips and... Uh, wait a minute, that's not in the script. I'd puke if she said that to me. <laughs> uh, she's not saying it to you, Clarence. I am. <laughs> That's great. You're such a good actor. <laughs> there for a second you were acting just like a, just like a queer. Clarence, I'm not a queer. I just don't have a preference. Get out of here. <laughs> I'm serious, Clarence. Get out of here. I'm serious too. Get out of here. Get out of my house. Get out of my yard. Right. Get out right. of my life. Okay. <sighs> Oh. 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 
Where are you girls going? Uh, to the powder room. I've got to powder my nose. Okay, we'll be here. <laughs> hey, hey, Doug. Why does it take two girls to powder one nose? I don't know. It's just one of those things. Why does a chicken cross the street? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, they're gone. All right. Hey, hey, Doug, come here. Hey, take a look at this. What's this? Yeah, hurry up. Hurry up. They'll be back in a minute. Okay. Uh, a ring, man. <laughs> yeah. For me? Think about it, Collins. Engagement? You're getting married. You got Congratulations. it. Congratulations. All, right. All right. Who to? Uh, Susan, what do you think? Well, great. Does she know? Collins. Collins, I'm disappointed. I I'm insulted. Does she know? Of course not. I'm going to pop the question tonight. <laughs> what question? <laughs> Come on, I'm serious about this, all right? Well, I know, but I mean, you're not going to do it while we're all here, are you? Look, look, when we leave here, we're going to go to Hunter's Point. Now, once we get up there, then I'm going to take my right hand, and I'm going to put it around my head, and I'm going to scratch my nose. Now, when I do that, then you'll know to take off for a minute, okay? Okay, scratch, you can remember that? scratch, scratch the, nose. the nose. I don't normally do that. Okay, all right. Yeah, Damn, man, this is nice. Yeah, How much did this cost? A thousand bucks? Twenty-five. Twenty-five thousand dollars? What are you guys talking about? A basketball, you <laughs> yeah, see. Uh, yeah, last year, state championship. <laughs> Beat them to pieces, thousand to a hundred points, you know? Triple overtime. Wow. Great. Well, it must be yeah. quite a game. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> yeah. it was That's what I like. All right. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, just fine. Excuse me. Any, uh, any dessert here tonight? Uh, none for me. Me. <laughs> okay, I'll just take care of this whenever you're ready. Great. Hey, we're ready. Take care of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe some know. cash, sir, I would know. be nice. I'm just kidding. Here, I got some money. What, $19.97? Here, I'll tell you what. 20 bucks, I need the change, okay? And, uh, can I get, can I get some, uh, some more tea, please? Thanks. Oh, may I? You may. <laughs> this guy's great. <laughs> Gosh, Doug, isn't it beautiful here tonight? Yeah, it's it's nice, real nice. Uh, a little bit nippy, <laughs> kind of nice. <laughs> well, hey, let me warm you up. Uh, oh. Ooh. Ah. Ah. Hi. Uh, Doug, what are you doing? I, I just felt kind of car sick over there. I, something funny in my stomach. I think it was my spirit man saying, get out. Hi. Doug, look at me. Y yeah, yeah, Jonathan. Well, you, you got kind of a cramp there in your arm. Doug. Oh, ah. oh yeah. Um, Cheryl, let's, let's go for a walk. Come on. Sure, we can warm up outside. Yeah, we can warm up out here. We can go for a jog. No, no, we'll, we'll go for a brisk walk. Maybe do some jumping jacks later. <laughs> Doug, it's yeah. really chilly out here. Okay, uh, I'll get your jacket, Cheryl. You, you wait right there, okay? Oh, uh, you guys, uh, don't, don't do that. Listen, uh, they, they were using your jacket for, for a pillow. It's not pretty. But you, you can wear my jacket. Here you go. Doug, I really don't want your jacket. Well, time out, Cheryl. Time out. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but but haven't you gotten just a teensy weensy a little bit more aggressive than you used to be? I mean, Cheryl, we're not going out anymore, okay? Uh, you you live in Jersey, I live here, and uh, you, you just cannot turn this romance thing on and off, okay? But Doug, I am so happy to see you, and haven't you gotten a teensy weensy bit cuter since the last time that I saw you? No. Ooh. We've been working out? No, I haven't. Stop it. That's just my, my shirt making making ruffles there. That, that's not me working out. Cheryl. Cheryl, listen, it's really good to see you too, but but uh, the problem is is I can't see you because it, it's so dark out here. Let's go to shopping bond. There, there's light there. there there's people. <laughs> there's, there's Twinkies. Let's go buy some Twinkies. Doug, they're not going to know where we've gone. I'll, I'll leave a note on the windshield. Do you have a pen? Doug, my purse is in the car. Uh, that's okay. Maybe maybe one of these people have a pen. Okay? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, do, do you have a pen I could borrow? Sure. Need anything else? No! No, I... I quit it! I don't want your pen! Yo! You guys! Uh, stop that! We're, we're gonna go up to shopping bot. You come get us right now. Come on, Charlotte. Let's jog. <laughs> get warm. Go! Ow! <laughs> Don't tickle me, that hurts. 
Listen, uh, this ain't working. Can you get me a three-quarter inch saw? I believe that'll that'll get it. Yeah, th that's not a saw. Okay. Doug, you don't need a saw to change the water hose. You just have to loosen the clamps. Okay, Miss Mechanic, I'll let you do it. Go. On. No. <laughs> now I think it's time that we take a break. Okay. I think we need to do something a little more recreational. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's go throw some horseshoes in the backyard, huh? <laughs> No, that's not what I really had in mind. Something more indoors. Okay, Cheryl. Let's just have sex. Why don't you just come out and say it? I mean, that's the message that you've been giving me ever since you got back. I didn't say sex. Doug, I just need someone to hold me. I mean, ever since I've moved, my parents, they're never home. I don't have any close friends. I just miss you, Doug. I gotta go. No, no, don't go. Listen, I miss you too, okay? I'm sorry. I tell you what. Why don't you come over tonight? I've got the whole apartment to myself. We can rent videos and watch them all night together. Okay, let, let me get the picture here. Uh, you want me to come to your apartment and uh, we'll be all alone and we'll watch some videos and uh, after they're over, we'll uh, make out or something. Mm, if you want to. I just want to show you how much I love you. Listen, Cheryl, wait. If you want to show me how much you love me, why don't you make my car payment, okay? I mean, f feed me some chicken soup when I get sick. Hey, if we were married, we could have sex right now, but we're not. I, I just can't believe the way you've been acting lately. I mean, I, I wonder if you're even still a virgin. You're right, Doug. I'm not a virgin. And you're just mad because it wasn't you. I guess I'm going to have to go someplace else to find a real man. I hope your Bible keeps you company tonight. Bye, Cheryl. Boy, Cheryl seemed upset. Did you guys have a fight? Yes. Doug, put the pillow down. Want to talk about it? Yes. You want to start the conversation? No, not really. Doug, don't spin the lampshade. Son, get over here and sit down. Doug, it's not unusual for guys your age to be tempted by girls, women, opposite sex. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Have you ever been tempted? Yeah, of course I have. So Cheryl's been coming on to you, physically? Yeah. How'd you know? Heard you guys talking in the garage. Dad, I, I don't understand it. I mean, why is she acting this way? She's changed so much. Doug, the Bible talks about an immoral woman. It said that the path of an immoral woman leads to death. And it also says that we need to flee youthful lust. That's what you need to do. Dad, Cheryl was not immoral. I mean, she, she's a nice girl. She's one of my best friends. It's just that she's... She's mixed up at this point in her life. And you need to be her friend, but don't be alone with her. What, do you think if I get alone with her that uh, I won't be able to handle it? Doug, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says to flee youthful lust. So you think if I get alone, I might fall prey to lust or do something I shouldn't do? Yes. Maybe you're right. Where are you going? I gotta go to track practice, hand in my physical. I gotta get my stuff. So what did you and Clarence do last night, Ty? You haven't talked to him? I figured he would have told you all about it. Collins, get your physical over here right now. You're not going to be competing this weekend. Hey, coach, check it out. Perfect condition. All right, let's have it. Listen, where was Jonathan today? I need his physical, too. I don't know. I think he's going to get it, and then he was coming over here to track. I saw Susan take off in his car. I mean, he's got to be hanging around here somewhere. Hey, Ty! Come on, let's go. You get the videotapes? I've got them. Let's go. <laughs> hey, thanks for letting Cheryl go. 
After all, one man's trash is another man's treasure. She's one hot chick, Dougie. <laughs> You're sick, Ty. Jonathan. Jonathan, what are you doing, man? Daydreaming about your wedding day? Listen, coach said you better get the results of your physical in her. You won't be running this weekend. Look, Collins, just take off, all right? <laughs> Look, what is it? Did you have a fight with Susan? Just give me the results of your physical. I'll take it to the coach. You want the results of my physical? I'll give you the results of my physical. I'm dying, all right? I'm dying! What do you mean you're dying, man? You're not dying. You're only 18 years old. You're one of the strongest runners on our team. What is it? Is it Susan? Yeah. Yeah, it's Susan. She gave me AIDS, Doug. AIDS? Get out of here. No one around here has AIDS. What makes you say that? The physical, Doug. Look! HIV positive. Less than a year, man. Active. You got AIDS? Yeah. I'm sorry. Listen. Jesus can help you. I mean, I, I want to try to understand. You want to understand? Fine, you can understand. <laughs> Tag, you're it. Now maybe you've got it too, huh? Hey man, don't freak out. You're not dead yet. Just because you have AIDS doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love you. What's Jesus going to do for me now, huh? Help me die gracefully? Look, i got some questions for your Jesus. Where is he anyway? Why do you let me get AIDS in the first place, huh? Come on, you and him are buddies. Why aren't you asking for it? We'll go there right now. We'll ask. Come on, buddy, let's go. Come on, man. Let's go. I want to read you something from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13, and verse number 10. It says, Then Amnon said unto Tamar, his sister, Bring the food here into my bedroom, so that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she had took it to him to eat it, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said unto him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. And verse 14 says, But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Now get verse 15. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said unto her after that, Get up and get out. You know what? Amnon, like so many young people today in this generation, confused lust with love. And it destroyed a relationship with his sister. And there's so many young people that maybe even are watching right now, and you've seen your relationships go down the tube because you allowed lust to come into that relationship that should have have never been there. So many relationships have been destroyed because of that. And God wants to give you real true love. In fact, I think just about everybody really wants a real meaningful relationship that is lasting. And you're not going to get it by going the world's way. The world says to go out and date anyone that comes along. God doesn't say that. In fact, dating is not even found in the Bible. I didn't say it's wrong to go out with a girl or a guy. I just said dating's not in the Bible. But you know what is in the Bible? Friendships. God wants you to make a lot of good friends. He's not so interested in how many dates you have in, in the next month. And, and what's the difference between a date and a friendship? A date is to check each other out, you know? What do you have? What, what are you going to do for me? And a friendship is a commitment to one another. A date many times produces jealousy. Uh, a friendship encourages character. Uh, a date is a one-time shot. A friendship is lasting, and, and it's a love commitment. The Bible says a friend loves at all times. And romance is an advanced stage. I'd rather go back and say, let's look at friending. Friending is the period and time in which male and female children and teenagers are moving together in large social groups, enjoying being with each other, understanding each other, but nobody pairing off or claiming one person as over another one. Now let me give you some guidelines that, that I believe are from the Word of God that will help you to stay pure in your relationships and not get hurt and not get burnt. First of all, go out with those that have the same convictions spiritually as you. The Bible's very clear. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, don't be an equally yoked with an unbeliever. The reason for that is when you become yoked with someone who doesn't believe like you do, they influence you many times instead of you influencing them. I had friends in high school that were Christians and said, Blaine, man, I'm going to go out with so-and-so. I know she's a sinner and I know she's, you know, not living for God, but I'm going to win her to the Lord by going out and dating her. You know what? It never happened. Most of the time, they won my friend back into the world. 
world and they backslid. And so stay away from people uh, in, in relationships that don't have convictions of the Word of God like you do. Secondly, when you go out with someone, make definite plans. Don't just kind of go out and say, well, we'll just see what happens. We'll do whatever comes natural. Don't do that, man. Say, okay, I'm going to pick it this time. We're going to go out here. We're going to ha- you know, do this activity together, and then we're going to come back, and I'll have you home at this time. Have fun activities, things that are, that are good to do, but don't just go out and say, we'll just see what happens, because that's when trouble can come in. Also, avoid being alone, all right? Go out on double dates, triple dates, go out with your youth group, go to Christian concerts, go to where other people are. You know, if you're alone, a lot of things can happen. And I'll tell you this, no one has ever committed sexual immorality when two or three other people have been standing around. So you're safe when you're with other people. Fourthly, be strong in your convictions and communicate those convictions openly with the people you go out with. In other words, tell them what your standards are right from the beginning. That way they don't have to experiment to find out. And and be strong when you tell them. If someone makes a move at you, one of you girls, he start, you know, Tom starts blowing in your ear, just turn to Tom and say, Tom, don't do that. Okay, do you understand? Don't blow in my ear, all right? And 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 make sure you say it the right way. I mean, don't look at Tom and say, you know, Tom, you know, that's that's really feeling good. And if you keep doing that, man, I'm really gonna, you know, who knows what I might do. Don't don't just be strong and say, hey, this is the way it is, stop it. Communicate real real boldly and real openly. You know, some of you may be out there and saying, well, Blaine, I, I've already kind of messed up in this area. I've already blown it. Well, you know what? There's a lot of other young people that have too, but they've been forgiven. And you can be forgiven. No matter what I had done, and no matter what anybody else had done, that God still loved me. And there was a hope for me, and there was a, a ch- there was every chance in the world for me to change and be a normal person. I accepted Christ as my Savior. So many people think, well, God can give, forgive me all but a sexual sin. says, no, forgive you all sin. First, you acknowledge it as sin. Second, you confess it. Third, you acknowledge that God has forgiven you. In Hebrews chapter 10, read it. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 to the end of the chapter. It talks about how Christ made one sacrifice for all times, for all sin, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, He paid the price for all sin, no matter if it's in the sexual arena or what. As you've just heard, the most important relationship that you could ever make right is your relationship with God. You see, God loved you so much that He sent Jesus Christ to die for you and to give you that love that you're looking for. Only Jesus can fill that emptiness inside with His love. And some of you are crying out for that right now. You say, Blaine, I need that love. I need to know I'm forgiven. Some of you, if you die tonight, you're not sure that you'd go to heaven. You're not sure that you're right with God and that your sins are forgiven. Guess what? You can be. I want to pray with you right now. Would you bow your head? just for a moment, close your eyes. I want to pray with you. Father, I ask you right now to do a work in every person's heart that is watching. Cause them to know that they can be a new creature in Christ if they'll just call upon you and make you the Lord of their life. I thank you, Jesus, for for moving and infiltrating their heart with your love and proving to them how much they are worth in your sight. And we give you praise for all that you've done and all that you're going to do in every heart and every life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. We're excited about what Jesus Christ is doing in your life. And we don't want you to miss next time when we come back and we talk about the consequences of sexual immorality. We're going to be discussing AIDS, abortion, and many other things. More powerful interviews. You won't want to miss it. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Don't miss the exciting conclusion of Family First on our next Fire by Night. You murdered me! So what? You you going to sue me, huh? Hey. Hey, man. Come on. It's just that when you left for Jersey, I mean, we we made a commitment to one another and to the Lord to stay pure. Why'd you have to give that up? I was raped. 